Hello, I'm Graham Norton. We've got a great lineup on tonight's show, including the fabulous Colin Farrell. Whoa, 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 whoa. I told you, Dawn, this is my bit. Thank you, and thank you. Hello, I'm Graham Norton. We've got a great lineup on tonight's show, including the fabulous Colin Farrell. Thank you. Let's start the show. You've seen, ladies and gentlemen, so much top totty on the sofa tonight. And uh, later, going to get even steamier, ladies and gentlemen, because Rod Stewart's joining us. Yes, he is. <laughs> Rod Stewart, you know? Rod Stewart, yeah. Rod always looks so fabulous over the decades, you know. And the thing I've noticed is his hair, his hair has always liked to pay homage to so many style icons. Uh, for instance, Dusty Springfield. There you go. <laughs> Then there's the Bonnie Tyler, yeah. <laughs> complete with leggings. I like that. So good. And perhaps my favourite of all, yes, it's the Gloria Honeyford, ladies and gentlemen. It's beautiful, beautiful. That's insane. Hey, let's get my first set of guests on. He's gone from computer geek to the IT crowd to Hollywood cheek in films like Bridesmaids, and this is 40. Now starring in the Lance Armstrong biopic, The Program, please welcome Mr. Chris O'Dowd. <laughs> Genius, who's tickled the nation for over 30 years and now transformed herself into a hugely successful novelist. It is the divine Dawn French! She starred in the action franchise The Mummy, won an Oscar for her turn in The Constant Gardener. Please welcome Rachel Weiss, everybody! <laughs> With Rachel in the new dark romantic comedy The Lobster, a great Irish actor who's given us films as diverse as In Bruges, Minority Report, and Saving Mr. Banks. It is the one and only Colin Farrell, everybody! Welcome all! And of course, uh, Rachel and Dawn. Yes. Here you are on my sofa tonight in a sort of Club Irish sandwich. Look at I this. Know. Oh, nice. I like it. Oh, right. It's good, right? I like yeah. it. It's good. With yes. the filling. Yes. <laughs> but I, I want soda bread meets soda bread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> soda bread meets pasty. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. A pasty sandwich. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, let's order I, out. I don't you know think I ever tried that because I have. <laughs> Because Chris O'Dowd, very handsome man, very handsome. Aww. But Colin Farrell, beautiful. Right. <laughs> Beautiful fair, man. Fair, yeah. You're a beautiful man. <laughs> Thank you for recognising the distinction. Uh, you are. No, you're a beautiful man. Okay, hey, Graham, get a room. <laughs> I'm in it. Uh, <laughs> the whole show is a room. Uh, so, no, but I feel, though, Colin, sometimes you... I feel too, Graham. You, you fight your own beauty. You fight your beauty. And you often use the medium of hair. To fight you oh, I've had some of the worst hairdos in film. Uh, you really have? Yeah, no, genuinely. Like, if Empire Magazine did top ten worst hairdos in film, I'm definitely three of those. <laughs> but, you know, some of those are intentional. Like, Horrible Bosses is intentional, and that's... Oh, yeah. That, that wasn't one of the three I was talking about. <laughs> Seriously. But a movie I love, Home at the End of the World. Oh, thanks. Uh, it's just such a good movie, and you're so good in it. However... That's had to be hampered, I feel. Oh, yeah, that's bad. Wow. I mean, that's a testament to what a mess I was at the time that I actually stood in front of a camera with that in my head. <laughs> I believe I've gone to dinner with her. <laughs> <laughs> but then I think your most famous is, of course, this one in Alexander. Which oh. There's worse pictures than that from Alexander. That's actually not bad. That was my Doris Day look. <laughs> yeah. Because you're so not a blonde. I mean, it did seem a big decision to make. Or was Alexander famously blonde? He was famously blonde, yeah. Golden locked, golden locked child. But uh, oh. he shouldn't have been. He should have been brunette. <laughs> for sure. And maybe he shouldn't have had an Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> Only from the 7,000 reviews I read. <laughs> 
Everyone has an opinion. <laughs> Everyone has an opinion. <laughs> yeah. But now, also, Chris, it's quite nice that we sat beside Dawn, because then it's like being at home yes. sitting on the sofa. With the hair and everything. I mean, it's, it is yeah. the same, because, yes. Well, I think I had the hair first, I have to say. <laughs> I'm quite a lot older than his Dawn. Dawn O'Porter, your wife? Yes. 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 Oh, that's her there now. Yeah. <laughs> It is the same hair. No, look at us. Quite similar. It is very similar. This is what you're going to be looking at in another 20 years' time. This is it. I'll be on wife three by then. Makes you feel so special. Dawn might move on because uh, other Dawn. Yeah. Uh, because she likes meeting men. It seems even in your presence, Chris. <laughs> Uh, no. Oh, yeah, she does. Uh, <laughs> she does. She does. Well, like anybody would. We've had a couple of things where. Um, <laughs> so we met Brad Pitt, <laughs> right? See. At the <laughs> Baftas, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, he came over and he, he was. Uh, we were having a chat about something or other, and um, <laughs> uh, he was very nice. And I introduced him to Dawn, and they shook hands, and then we kind of kept on talking, and then he started talking to somebody else or whatever. And then after a while, I looked down and I realised that she was still holding two of his fingers. <laughs> and I was like, we better go to our seats. <laughs> and she's like, OK. And she said, 41 seconds. I said, what? That's how long I held him for. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks after that, we went for some other kind of awards dinner and... Um, and Bradley Cooper was there. Very nice guy, very kind of personable. Yes, yeah, a who, that's how yeah. attractive he is. And uh, we were leaving, and she was getting her phone out of her bag, and I noticed something sparkling in it. And I realised that she had stolen his fork. <laughs> and she said that she was going to auction it for charity or something. <laughs> But every now and again at home, <laughs> I see her eating with it. <laughs> it's kind of it's hard to feel like a sex symbol when your wife is using another man's cooking. <laughs> so she only managed with Brad Pitt. She only managed to hold on to his fingers, though. Did That's she? right. So hands up, everybody here who's actually been kissed on the lips by Brad Pitt. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> I was just in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> now, we must talk about the lobster, ladies and gentlemen. It opens tonight, the lobster, and uh, Rachel and Colin star in it. It's had rave reviews. It won the jury prize at Cannes. This yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I loved it. And it's one of those things, in this moment, I am now, I don't envy you both. Because, Having to talk about well, it? Because it's a very hard film. It's great to watch. Yeah. And afterwards, you come out going, that was great. But it's quite hard to explain to anyone what the hell happens? Uh, so, good, good luck. Rachel's really good at explaining. <laughs> <laughs> what happens in the film? I still am fully sure. But... <laughs> well, it's, um, it's sci-fi, but no spaceships or special effects. It's set in a world that looks like our world, but there are different rules. Rules are you have to live in a couple. If you don't live in a couple, you get sent to a hotel. We have 45 days to find a mate. And if you don't find a mate, you'll get turned into an animal of your choosing. Colin's character, David, says he would be a lobster. Yeah. And <laughs> but he escapes from the hotel into the woods where there are loners, and I'm a loner. And the rules of that universe are that you have to live alone. You're not allowed to be in a couple. But Colin's character, David, and, and myself, we fall in love. So it's a very romantic film because it's about love transcending obstacles of, uh, you know, stuff getting in the way of falling in love. Is that what you got out of it? see it now. Yeah. Is that what you got out of it? Oh, oh, oh well, that's just that the amazing. story. I mean, you can interpret it any way you like. That's amazing. Oh, I thought it was like an ad for being single. <laughs> yeah. Well, it... I see what you mean. I know, I know, yeah. but, but also, it's very funny. There's lots of kind of laugh out loud bits. Oh, yeah, it's a comedy. Yeah, but then, yeah. but then there's very dark bits, yeah, too. Yeah, it's very violent it's a very and very absurd. And and yeah. <laughs> yes. what, what's weird yeah. is, before you started all of this, it sounded like it was going to be confusing. <laughs> <laughs> but you've nailed it. With, uh... <laughs> I'll tell you what, let's pause for a clip. Uh, so Colin has escaped the hotel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Gone into the woods, yeah. met your character, Rachel, yeah. and you are trying to keep your relationship a, a secret because there are terrible consequences if they find out. Oh, that it's you terrible kiss. consequences if you, yeah, if or you're caught flirt. flirting, you get a thing called the red kiss, which your lips are slashed with a razor blade and you're made to kiss each other and see how really much. It's funnier than that, yeah. okay? <laughs>
and you don't see that That's happen. That's the comedic apex yeah. of the whole yeah. <laughs> You don't see that happen. No, you just see somebody with a bandage on his lips and red blood coming through, yeah. and I say, ask, him, oh, ask yeah. him what happened to him. And yeah. It's a very romantic That's a funny film. Bit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Anyway, this is, this is the two of you trying to keep your relationship a secret uh, by developing a, a sign language. We've developed a code so that we can communicate with each other, even in front of the others, without them knowing what we are saying. When we turn our heads to the left, it means, I love you more than anything in the world. And when we turn our heads to the right, it means, watch out, we're in danger. We had to be very careful in the beginning not to mix up I love you more than anything in the world with Watch out, we're in danger. <laughs> when we raise our left arm, it means I want to dance in your arms. When we make a fist and put it behind our backs, it means let's fuck. <laughs> the code grew and grew as time went by and within a few weeks, we could talk about almost anything without even opening our mouths. Thing. So, can you explain why your character thought being a lobster was a good idea? Uh, well, a, because lobsters live to be a ripe old age and they stay fertile for the rest of their lives. Uh -huh. And they have blue blood like aristocrats, I believe, is the line. But I don't understand what any of that means. Yeah. I just said it. Yeah, but also you like swimming as well. Yeah. Well, do lobsters, lobsters swim? They more. Well, I must say, I, I didn't think so, but you. They you, scuttle. Did I say? Oh, he said he was a good swimmer. I think, yeah, yeah he likes to yeah, be yeah, in the water, yeah, bless yeah, yeah. him. And Rachel, <laughs> we never find out what you would have been. What, what would you be? I would like to be a pony owned by a 13-year-old girl Aww. in England. Actually, by me when I was 13. I didn't have one, but I would be loved and ridden a lot, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I want that. Just leave it. I want everyone home to promise it. not to clip that Leave bit. it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you pick an animal? Well, I know if... Well, you write to be something... I'm just surprised not everyone... Why do you didn't all just choose to be monkeys? Because then you're so close to still being people. No one's ever said that. We've asked this question a lot. You're the first monkey. Because monkeys can drive cars, they can play the piano, <laughs> they can, they can go to space, they never come back. Yeah, yeah they can yeah. go to space. Yeah. Yeah. It's a no-brainer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Why didn't anyone think about it before? I believe it's the sequel to The Lobster. Yeah. <laughs> Planet of the Apes. Yes. Falling <laughs> <laughs> shit at Rachel for two hours, it's going to be great. <laughs> hey, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Dawn French, oh, so busy. Yes. Uh, a new novel, your third novel. Yes, third indeed. novel. Uh, I've got it here. I've got I've... it in your cupboard. Yes, according <laughs> to yes. Yes. And what strikes me about this is that you don't hear your voice anymore. You know, oh, okay. it's, it's a it's a novel by a writer. Okay, fine. Did that you find one's slightly grown up? Well, did I you think. find did you find this one easier to write? Did you come to this thinking, well, I know what I'm doing? Um, well, I mean, as you say, the other novels I've written, I've written in diary form or monologue form, and I decided, no, I, I really can write people talking to each other in chapters with sentences that is a bit more grown up. And this was an idea actually I had a lot of years ago because I I went to school in New York, but I ran out of money very quickly. I mean, I took 200 quid that I'd earned as a chambermaid with me in my pocket, thought that would last me a year. No. <laughs> and do you know why it didn't last me a year? Because they sell pizza in slices on every corner. <laughs> <laughs> they just got bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, ran out of money and decided to, be, to, in order to be able to stay, I had to, to get a job. So I used to be a nanny and look after people's kids. I've never looked after anyone's kid ever in my life. I can't believe that people entrust you <laughs> with their children when you've got no qualifications whatsoever. And they give me the keys to their apartments. And so I would be picking up their little kids from school, uh, taking them home, cooking for them, waiting till mum and dad got home and, or whatever. And one little kid that I looked after, his parents were getting divorced. And so I was right on the inside, the very intimate inside of their family life and saw things and heard things that I really shouldn't have known. And so that was my kind of starting point for that book. Yeah. And we should say, we don't want to give anything away. No. But the nanny in this book 
Well, social services wouldn't be thrilled with everything she does. <laughs> no. She, um, well, she decides to live her life according to yes, uh, because she, you know, she's running away from some secrets and some sorrows, and she decides to have a, a kind of more liberal life and to say yes to more things. And she certainly does say yes to... Yes, she does. very saucy thing. I know. Oh, so I, I, I blushed. It, it's the first time I've ever written sex like this. It was like... <laughs> and I found myself in my house in Cornwall, on my own, in thinking my office, of Chris shutting, <laughs> <laughs> shutting, thinking of you. Oh. Uh, no, and you, I'm and not, you. Yeah, oh, there's right there. there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would actually shut the door because I felt quite embarrassed about doing the writing. <laughs> how, how funny oh, is that? Well, I just lovely. shut the that's door lovely. on my life so that I could write it and go right into my sort of carnal head. Yeah. <laughs> and, and obviously being a nanny is very different from being a parent. Yeah. And, uh, I heard you talk about that when you were bringing up Billy, one of the things, she couldn't quite get her head around what you and Lenny did. Yeah, it's true. She, she was asked at school when she was about seven uh, what her parents did, and she said that her dad was a chef and her mum was a vicar. <laughs> <laughs> of true, <laughs> but it made me realise that I hadn't really explained what yeah. the jobs were, you know, she just yeah. decided she'd visited the sets and that's what she decided. Because, Rachel, your son Henry has a kind of a similar... There's you and then there's this other woman. Yeah, he actually has never seen any of my films. He's completely, delightfully totally uninterested in seeing any of them even though now he's nine and he would be able to see for instance the mummy would be but he's just not interested he just so he's never seen the other woman he's gonna love the lobster and now colin you've got a, you've got a, a son henry as well i have a son henry as well yeah, yeah. and now henry. was it father's day when who sent you the text because he can't have sent you the text he's not texting yet with his six-year-old fingers. I'm sure some six-year-olds are texting and rapidly, but um, he is tweeting. No, he's not tweeting. <laughs> Basically, on Father's Day, they asked, uh, the teachers asked the kids in his class, we're going to come around you all, and any of you who have fathers, that is, and ask you what you want to say to your dads, and then we'll transcribe it. And so they sent home a letter, which spontaneously I happen to have queued up on my phone. <laughs> and because I was asked to read it, because it's just kind of gorgeous and ridiculous. So he dictated this to the teacher. The yeah. Teacher down. And, it says, and how, old, how old was he when he wrote this? He was four when he said these words. Okay. And he said, my dad, he's a lot of fun and I like him a lot. He has blonde hair. <laughs> and he's very handsome and wears a good shirt, good pants and good shoes. Oh. We play and I watch a movie with him and my mommy is in it and I am in it in the sky, he says that. That's because I met his mother on a film. But yeah, but the bit about the blonde hair had me a little obviously concerned and I was going to reach out for a home kit paternity test. But, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, Can you imagine the teacher's maybe, reaction when he said that as well? Maybe, maybe so Alexander. Alexander! No, because he still talks to me. Okay. <laughs> 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 Chris O'Dowd quite new to the father. What is it, eight months, you say? Eight, yeah, eight, 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 eight and a half months. months. But you, in, the, in that very modern way, you announced the birth uh, via Twitter. Yes. Well, during, during, while it was, while she was crowning. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, yes, yeah, in selfie. the subsequent days. Selfie. <laughs> selfie. <laughs> but but you, you did post a picture. We, we did. Uh, um, and luckily, uh, the baby looked exactly like... Uh, equidistant between us physically, um, and we thought that people should see it. I, I've got the picture here. There, there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she, you know, he, she is beautiful. Uh, <laughs> um, now, but this is genius. People are going to steal this idea because you are preparing um, a, a treat for Art's future, aren't you? Oh, God, I've got this great thing going. This is brilliant. So I'm playing a long form joke on him. Where um, <laughs> I live in a, in a quite Latino part of California at the moment, and um, uh, the the park where I walk uh, my dog, uh, I've kind of befriended a bunch of families in the area, and there's a particular family that uh, have a picnic there, kind of most days, and I've started bringing the baby there and having him sit with them, and I've taken a picture. And I've taken a bunch of pictures, and the plan is I'm getting them developed, 
and in the future I'm going to put them behind photo frame, like in photo frames behind other pictures around our house. <laughs> With the hope that, like, at some stage, he'll be, you know, when he's 16, 17, I need a, a picture frame for something if such a thing still exists. And I'm like, oh, just take one from upstairs. And it will come out, and he'll think he's adopted. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't hear the thing. He will never believe you when yeah. you say... He'll believe you a bit when you say it's a joke, yeah. but not really because it's so bonkers to wait 16 years for a punchline. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, it was a joke that we were doing. The joke will be on you when he asks to be returned. <laughs> yeah, as you watch him spend the rest of his life trying to find his birth yeah. parents. <laughs> Chris had a new film, uh, it's called The Programme, and it's out tonight. And this is uh, Stephen Freer's take on the Lance Armstrong story. And, but uh, when Stephen asked you for the meeting, you didn't know what it was about, apparently. No, it was kind of cloak and daggers, really, I suppose, because it was a slightly controversial subject, and a few people were talking about developing Lance Armstrong's story at the time. So he said, I just want to come and come to my office and we'll talk about it. So, um... I went to his office wherever it was and I had no idea what the film was about in any way or what it was. And he said, how much do you know about Lance Armstrong? And because I'm an actor, like my kind of head started going in a, in a thousand different directions and I was like, can I play Lance Armstrong? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, of course I can. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Great character, you know, really is that thing. And he's like, how much do you know about the Irish journalist David Walsh? <laughs> <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> He's got the home base. Uh, so, yeah, so I play uh, David Walsh, who, who the, the book um, Seven Deadly Sins, which the film is kind of based on, is uh, where the film comes from. Um, and he's the guy who's been chasing the truth, I guess, about Lance Armstrong's drug taken for so long. And uh, you had a kind of weird connection... Oh, with yeah. David Walsh. It was before you started filming? Okay, so what happened was, after I came from this meeting with Stephen Frears when he told me about the film for the first time, um, he had given me the book, which the film is based on, and I had been kind of devouring it, and it's great, a wonderful kind of journalistic uh, story. And uh, I went out for dinner with Dawn. Um, the and other Dawn? No, you. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> yes, I went out for dinner with my wife, and I was kind of telling her the whole story, and it's, it's terrific, it's a very engaging kind of tale. And we had a few drinks, and we had some food in Bermondsey, where we were living at the time, and um, this girl came over with, a, with her husband, and um, she said, uh, listen, I'm really sorry for interrupting you. And that happens a lot at restaurants when you're around, and so I tried to make a joke about people wanting photos or whatever, so I said, but you want to force them. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, uh, no, no, um... <laughs> Uh, I was listening to you talking about this story about David Walsh. Uh, I'm his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, what are the so chances? Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so sorry about the force of thing. <laughs> it was just like a boring joke that I would do a lot. And... However, the offer is it's still on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so we've got a, a clip. This is one of the kind of notorious press conferences where Lance Armstrong is starting to feel the heat. Next question. David Walsh, Sunday Times. Mr. Walsh, good to see you here. Um, Lance, do you feel a responsibility personally to promote a better image for cycling? And if so, how do you reconcile that with your doctor stroke trainer being so associated with doping? You're talking about Dr. Ferrari? I am. Right. Okay. I'm confident in my relationship with Dr. Ferrari. I believe he's an honest man. I believe he's a fair man. I believe he's an innocent man. You know, people are smart. People will look at the facts. People will say, okay, here's Lance Armstrong. Here's a relationship. Is that questionable? Perhaps. Will they say, Lance Armstrong tested positive? No. Because I have never tested positive for performance-enhancing drugs. Has Lance Armstrong been tested? Absolutely. I am the most tested athlete on the face of the planet. 
Is there now a test for EPO? Yes, there is. Will he pass every test because he does not take EPO? Yes, he will. Next question, please. No, no, no. You know, spoiler alert, um, it turns out he was taken. No. <laughs> yeah. He's what we in Cornwall cool like to call a bastard in Lyod. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but listen, we must also mention uh, Moon Boy. You've written a book, and it's the second Moon Boy book. Yes. The Fish Detective. The Fish Detective, yeah, for a kind of slightly younger audience, but it's, it's, it's really fun. And you co wrote it with Nick. With Nick, yeah, who writes the TV series of me, yeah. And the, the, the whole thing with Moon Boy, you sort of began it, as, uh, uh, revenge is a big word, but as revenge on your sisters. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I, I don't want to, it's harsh because they're wonderful women. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as girls, as, as I was as a boy, you know, tough, tough, strong country women. Um, like, there are knife marks on my fingers, and I'm not even... This is just... One of them went at me with a knife, and I asked her about it years later, why did she attack me with a knife, and she couldn't remember. <laughs> so, yeah. But every now and again, I'll get a text from one of them when they've just seen an episode, and they're like, I wasn't like that. And I'm like, well, you did do that. And they're like, yeah, we did do all of that. Because, <laughs> <laughs> Colin, you grew up with a, a lot of sisters as well, didn't you? Yeah, well, two. Oh, only two? Yes. Yeah, so oh, because I've heard you in interviews. It sounds like there were more, because they were... Oh, they both had voices in their heads, so... <laughs> <laughs> Quite a tough time, didn't they? Uh, they do, yeah. Well, I had one sister who used to rat on me. She still says she didn't, but I remember her mantra when we were growing up was, I'm going to tell mom. <laughs> <laughs> then the other sister was a really fast uh, 100 meter sprinter, and that translated in how she treated me to kicking me up the arse <laughs> on the regular with the most powerful left. I used to remember seeing her, her heel come over her shoulder. <laughs> And then the torque, and then she let it go. <laughs> that was, that was, that was our, sweet, our sweet Catherine. What sort of sister were you, Dawn? Uh, yeah, I was a pretty good sister, I think. I was a bit attention-seeking, I think. A quite violent. Uh, my brother and I, still to this day, cannot sit next to each other without violence happening. Uh, you know, it's friendly violence, uh, but it starts with a, you know, this and a bit of that and then a bit of Chinese burn and then a bit more and a bit more. But, you know, we are full-on wrestling. <laughs> and, and it really is almost to the death and it has to happen. It's just automatic. Our kids find it very strange and a bit sinister. <laughs> See, I, Rachel, you were very well behaved, weren't you? I imagine you were very well behaved always. I was very, very naughty. Were you really? <laughs> It's what you're meant to do when you're a child and adolescent, know. isn't it? I got expelled from school and... Did I was... you? Yes. Yes. No. What did you do? What did you do? What did you do? What did you do? Always my mother always says, you weren't expelled, you were asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and you accept it. Yeah. yeah. What did you do? What did you... Can well, you tell I... us? It was terrible. Well, it, I didn't... There wasn't one big event. I didn't try and set the school on fire or, you know... It was just... Conti... I had an authority issue. So I didn't believe that anyone had the right to uh, tell me what to do. So I would just disrupt classes and answer but I just was very 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 disruptive yeah wow yeah. 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 And, and have you got over because it must be quite hard <laughs> with directors and things is that quite hard if you don't like being told what to do <laughs> well now I don't mind a bit of authority I'm all right with it oh, hello. Just okay. a little... <laughs> <laughs> oh you flirt <laughs> And we, we have to mention, because it, this is fabulous, Dawn French, you are going into London's glittering West End. I am. In your one-woman show. I am. Which is called 30 Million Minutes. Correct. Now, you toured this before. I did. But is it, is it exactly, it's going to be the same show? And... It's pretty much the same show, because, you know, it took me a while to write that show, and I took it all the way around the country and really loved doing it. And I thought, well, why haven't I done it in London? And, in fact, I'm going to Australia with it straight after Christmas, so we've only got a month that we can do it in London before we have to put the set on a ship and it goes to the other side of the world. So we're doing it at the Vaudeville for uh, a month in November. But it and, in starts... fact, it's going really well, so we've put some extra nights on there, which is good. <gasps> and now, for you, because you're on stage alone... Yeah. You know, because beforehand you were always on stage with Jennifer. I know. Which is that... 
Oh, it's very, it's very odd. It's, I miss her enormously, actually. Or I did when I first started. If she walked on the stage now, I'd, frankly, I'd punch her. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, when we started rehearsing, I did it with Michael Grandage. You know, he directed it. Pop. And he kept saying to me, why aren't you standing in the middle of the stage? I said, because another bird stands uh, there. That's where she should be. And he's uh, like, no, come on, go in the middle uh, of the stage. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I do that now. No, because, Rachel, you had that, that experience. You were on Broadway, but with your husband. Uh, yeah. Actually, I should say, uh, Daniel Craig going to be sat right there next week. We're just keeping it warm for him. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Does he have a film out? Uh, a <laughs> tiny little micro budget, ah. in detail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. not yeah. sure I can forgive you, actually, Rachel, because yeah. you have come between me and Daniel. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, I've never met Daniel, but um, <laughs> I decided he would be my husband, and then he decided on you. Oh. So I'm going to forgive you for that, but um, you, I've, I've got some bitterness. Do you know what you can some. buy? I've actually got one, one of those, um, those like, screen visor things that you put up at the top that say Mrs. Daniel Craig. You know, oh. those things you put, so you can buy them and you can... I've got one. Well, <laughs> no, wait a minute. You drive a car that says Mrs. Daniel Craig. <laughs> To keep it up all the time, but just now and again, I'll, I'll, you know those sort of see-through. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's hey, the technical hey, word. I've got a good idea. You have the screen visor, and I'll have Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> But like that, were American audiences kind of weird about the, the two of you being on stage together because it's kind of, there's part of it's real and part of it's not real? Because you were playing husband and wife. We were. We were playing husband and wife um, in a pin to play called Betrayal where oh, the husband, oh, I'm mate. sleeping with his best friend. But yeah, I mean, Broadway is, uh, I'd never done it before. It's that, it's a, culturally different to England in that when a famous person comes onto the stage, even if it's the middle of a, See, they've come in in the second act. There's a huge yeah. round of applause. Yeah. So it's like, really, whoa! It's, it's very, it's very odd. I think in Japan, people shout things out. Really? It's, every country has something different. In England, we just wait to the end. Yeah. Clap, <laughs> which seems really logical We've, to me. We reach but... for the Maltesers. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, do you, what do you do when people applaud? Do you, do you, you have to accept, wait? You just you stand there in character. You have to wait. Yeah, and obviously Daniel gets a really gets a really big one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've forgotten, I mean, I didn't Again, realize. don't clip that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to clip, I want to be ridden like a pony. <laughs> <laughs> It's time for our musical guest tonight. Now, this man is a Grammy-winning rock and roll icon. He sold over 200 million records worldwide. He's now back with his 29th studio album, Another Country. Please welcome the great Rod Stewart! <laughs> Very good. Hello, sir. Um, in fact, you were on the dawn before, weren't you? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. we did. Yes. Yeah. Oh, have, you, have you mentioned the footballs this evening? The three Republican boys. That's right. What oh, yes. sort of a show am I on? Yeah. <laughs> Not that show. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say the two of them look as clueless as I am? Why did you make me feel bad? No, because you, you put Scotland out. That's right. But you, you've done so well, and you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Is it the egg one or the round one? It's the round one. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> They're all going on. They're all going on. I, I know. Hey, uh, <laughs> it's like Gary Lineker. <laughs> <laughs> we are one BBC. Yeah. Gary's sick. I fill in. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Rod Stewart, you're back. This is, yes. this is your second album of new material. Yes, indeed. Another country. That on the 30th of October. And uh, you say you you got your kind of songwriting mojo back. Yeah, I did. It sort of left me for 10 years or 15 years. But in that time, I made the Great American Songbook. Yeah. So I wasn't, like, sitting on my bum. No, no, and they did incredibly well. They did, 28 yeah. million, but... Then, wow. Uh, yeah, indeed. 28, 28 million. million? That was you stepping away. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I put the book together, Rod, autobiography, and suddenly I realised I had so much to write about. So I wrote songs about my dad, my family, everything. Show business, the lot. And you're back on tour? Indeed, yes. Like I've never part... stopped touring. I love it. No, but this starts June next year. Yeah. And I suppose the challenge is, because you have all these hits, that 
you have all these diehard fans, and now you're going to be trying to introduce new songs. No, bollocks, in... I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will never hear this no, song no, again. I do, I do, I do. I give the people what they want to hear, and then add two or three new ones in there. But basically, they want to hear all the hits. If my heroes were alive, Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, I would want to hear the songs that made them famous. Yeah, but the song you're going to sing, it struck me with the three Irish words. It, am I wrong? It has a it's kind of an Irish... just better not be new. That's doesn't... all I know. Better not be new. <laughs> no, no. I just want the old, old shit. Well, you want the old one. <laughs> 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 no, it's called Love Is, but it does have an Irish feel to it. It's very Gaelic, very Celtic, yeah. Four on the floor with a banjo and a tambourine. Nice. And it's brilliant. You and should know, it. my mother knew that uh, I was going to be on tonight with Raj, and so she texted me saying... Tell him I'll see him in Kilkenny. Kilkenny. Oh, be Jesus. And but she said, tell him I'll see him in Kilkenny. Wink, wink. <laughs> Is she really going? Yeah, she's really going, yeah. Let's exchange numbers, I'll take care. We'll do meet and greet and everything. Oh, that's Don't that's do it, Chris. Don't do it. That's amazing. Thank you very much. That's cool. She is going to lock oh, you that's... up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, why don't you give uh, Chris's mom a taste of what's in store if you go over and join your okay. band? Uh, Shall I go behind this? Yeah, go, go, behi go behind no, 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 There you go. My, uh, my mum's obsessed with you. <laughs> yeah, see, Rod? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> she is. Well, I'll, I'll lap her up. <laughs> uh, okay. Shortly, we'll have this week's stories for the big red chair. But first, performing Love Is, ladies and gentlemen, it is Rob Stewart! <laughs> Irish sounded Irish, you very good. Lying. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, before we go, just time for a visit to the big red chair. Who is there? Hello! Hello. Oh, you're getting whoops in the crowd. <laughs> uh, what's your name? My name's Oliver. Oliver, lovely. And where are you from, Oliver? Northampton, but I live here. Okay. Oh, there's rounds of applause for you. <laughs> um, and uh, what do you do here? Uh, I work in events. In events? Yeah. Do you Corp organise them? Corporate events, yeah. You organise them? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Oh, 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 the couch are so not impressed by the man who <laughs> organises corporate events. He might organise good ones. He's they are terrified. good, they are good. He's terrified. Oh, is he? No, he's yeah. not. He's fine. He organises corporate he events. Look you know what? I just hate Northampton. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, off you go with this story. OK, so when I was younger, people always used to tell me that I looked like Zac Efron. Oh. So I was on a flight to Canada, and this guy comes over to you me... You got past that. <laughs> <laughs> This keep going, keep going. You're on a flight. This guy comes over to me and he's like, oh, my daughter loves you. Can, can I get your autograph? And I was like, oh, yeah, OK. I'm not really him, but let's go with it. And then he pulls out this violin and it was a gift to his daughter they'd been to London to buy. So I was like, oh, you want me to sign the violin? He's like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I don't think this pen's really going to write on this violin. He was like, yeah, yeah. So I ended up carving Zac Efron's signature. No! That's really good. That's good. That is good. Can he walk? That's good. You can walk. That's it. Who's up next? Hello. What's your name? Uh, John. John. And where are you from, John? Ireland. Oh. He is, he is, oh, he is from the island of Ireland. I've heard it. Uh, whereabouts? Uh, the West. The West. <laughs> OK. And where do you, do you still live there or do you live here now? Uh, no, I live what here. What I don't get is, like, on a night like tonight, when there's three Irishmen here, he's like, you won't understand it if I tell you where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> OK, off you go with your story. OK, so this... Who's it, John? It's John. It's John, yeah. John, John. It's John from the West. Hey, John. <laughs> John West. <laughs> I thought it was about something. Uh, OK. <laughs> uh, OK, so this happened about 20 years ago when I was about 10 years old at the time. Uh, so my parents were heading out for the evening, so they called up uh, Jenny, who was our babysitter at the time, um, to look after myself and my sister and my two brothers. But uh, Jenny was busy, she told them, but she said that our younger brother um, could babysit instead. Now, my mum wasn't too keen on this idea because her brother was only, like, 13 or 14 at the time. But uh, she eventually agreed when Jenny insisted that he was a really sensible, very mature young man. That turned out to be a complete lie. <laughs> uh, so, as soon as my parents left, we, we destroyed the house. And um, they came home early that evening and my mum walked into the kitchen and then stood there in a stunned silence as she looked around and saw the curtains had been ripped off the wall. Um, there was smashed glasses and plates. Um, there was paint splattered on the floor. My brother had a bloody nose. 
I had clumps of hair missing because I tried to give myself a haircut. <laughs> and she stood there for what seemed like an age until she finally turned to the babysitter and she said, you were in real trouble, Chris O'Dowd, when I tell your mother about this. <laughs> Is it really you? Wow. Is it really you? As it was going on. Wow. <laughs> As it kept progressing. <laughs> I was like, I don't like the sound. <laughs> We've all been through a lot. <laughs> Is that really you? Mm. All right, John. <laughs> Got to walk, surely. Got to walk. Yeah, go to walk. Go to walk. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the job for the big day of Jeff. Please don't forget that this very address. That is it for today. Please say a huge thank you to my guest, Mr. Rob Stewart, everybody. <laughs> with superstar singer Sam Smith, actress Naomi Harris, Oscar and winner Christoph Waltz, and James Bond himself, Daniel Craig. I'll see you then. Good night, everybody. Bye! <laughs>